Assalamu alaikum. My name is Salam Amriati. I'm the president of Muslim Public Affairs Council. I'm Wael Zayat, CEO of Engage and Engage Action. And uh, our panel is going to be on the January 6th insurrection and the rise uh, of white supremacist violence in our country as a threat to our democracy. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, the organizers and the hosts uh, of this wonderful conference, our inaugural uh, American Muslim National Policy Conference 2022. Uh, the first time that uh, uh, great organizations like ISPU, the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, um, the American Muslim Health Professionals, Engage, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, and a number of other supporting organizations are coming together for this policy conference. The main message is uh, for our government to start listening to American Muslim voices in its policy making. And it's for the betterment of American society, for the interests uh, of US policy. Uh, it would only make more sense if our US policymakers talk to Muslims instead of just talking about Muslims. So we're really excited about uh, this inaugural conference. And this particular session is, is critical uh, in terms not just of national security, uh, but also in terms of civil rights and in terms of democracy. I mean, we can look at it in one of two ways, that we are victims uh, of violence like everybody else. Uh, but more importantly, we are involved in the defense of democracy. And so working with our allies, with our partners in the Jewish, uh, Black, Latino, uh, Christian communities, Buddhist, Hindu communities, people of all backgrounds, in working against any type of, type of extremism and reconciling on the double standards uh, in our national security policy is critical uh, for the future of democracy. And I think that's really the, the deeper reason why we're involved in this issue. And with January 6th, what happened uh, as we all witnessed that day uh, and the investigation uh, after that is making us think uh, about where pluralistic democracy uh, can go, or, or if, if it has a future, uh, or are we only talking about ethno-religious uh, segmentation of our society? Uh, so Robert Pape, Dr. Robert Pape from the University of Chicago testified today to the U.S. Senate Committee uh, on Counterterrorism, and he said, the volatile capabilities and ideas, the combination of which produces a deadly cocktail that promises more violence is the main problem. Ideas based in the great replacement theory are given capability by financing of well, wealthy individuals. So these are some of the issues that are going to be addressed. And we have two very important guests who will be with us in the converse, conversation. Uh, the first is Acting <laughs> Assistant Secretary Samantha Vinograd with the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Ms. Vinograd is the Acting Assistant Secretary uh, for Counterterrorism and Threat Prevention and Senior Counselor for the National Security at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And she's been on CNN as a National Security Analyst, Senior Advisor at the Biden Institute, and a Visiting Fellow at the University of Chicago Institute of Politics. Also with us will be Senior Staff Attorney Diala Shemis of the Center for Constitutional Rights, Diala Shamas is a senior staff attorney for CCR, where she works on challenging government and law enforcement abuses perpetrated under the guise of national security, both in the US and abroad. Prior to joining the uh, CCR, Diala was clinical supervising attorney and lecturer in law at Stanford Law School and senior staff attorney supervisor, supervising the Clear Creating Law Enforcement Accountability and Responsibility Project at CUNI School of Law. So with that, uh, I'd like to go to uh, Samantha, if she's with us, and let her uh, respond to this quote uh, of Dr. Pape uh, today in, in the Senate. Where does the great white replacement theory uh, play a, a role in this rise uh, of violence and violent extremism in our country? Thank you for the question. And before I respond, let me just uh, share with all of you how pleased I am to be with you today. It is, is truly an honor to be speaking with you, having this conversation, answering your questions, and 
perhaps most importantly, just listening. So on behalf of the Department of Homeland Security, thank you uh, for having me here today. Well, we cannot hear, but can others? Can you, can you guys hear me? We cannot hear you. Uh, having some technical difficulties. I can hear her here. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead. Go ahead. How about now? Yes, can you hear me? thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Well, then I'm sorry to everyone who heard my intro before. I, I just wanted to share before answering your question how pleased I am to be with you today and what an honor it is to be speaking with you, answering your questions, and just most importantly, listening uh, to what all of you are experiencing, hearing, feeling. And I hope that this is the first of, of many, many conversations. So thank you for having me. With respect to your question on the white replacement theory, we are unfortunately in the midst of living real world examples of the impact that this horrific theory is having on communities within the United States and across the country. The white replacement theory has led to violence um, in uh, both hemispheres. And, uh, and we, uh, I'm hearing that we're, I'm still having audio issues. Can folks hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, the white replacement theory is leading to acts of violence and fatalities around the world. And the problem is, that the white replacement theory is being promulgated uh, in very open spaces. So these horrific theories um, that are abhorrent, they're unacceptable, are, not, are no longer just a matter of individuals exercising their rights to free speech. These horrific theories, whether it's white replacement theory or other uh, conspiracy theories or disinformation that we hear targeting specific groups of individuals, whether it's the Muslim community, the Jewish community, the immigrant community and elsewhere, we're seeing an, an actual nexus to violence, which is where the Department of Homeland Security comes in. Um, you know, our job is to identify, um, to work to evaluate potential acts of violence before they occur and seek to prevent them. And for example, in the case of Buffalo, where the white uh, replacement theory played such a particular role, this individual um, was sensibly radicalized over a period of time. Um, exhibited indicators that he was potentially going down a pathway for violence to violence. And there was very little um, help provided to him. What we seek to do at the department is to work with members of various communities such that when they see an individual consuming these horrific conspiracy theories, making threatening statements, spending time in extremist websites or digesting extremist material, for example, like the Christchurch Manifesto, that they place a call and ask for help such that an individual doesn't continue down that radicalization path. And that's something that we, we seek to work uh, with all communities on to prevent other acts of, more acts of violence. You know, the, the other part about the theory is that it actually started in France where it asserted that the problem was immigration and it was pointing to Muslims who, happen to be of Algerian, Moroccan, North African descent. And so this is an example where anti-Muslim animus is playing a role, even though in the United States it's not as much of a role, it's really directed at Jews, Blacks, and Latino communities. Um, and, and so we have an example where if we had addressed this problem earlier that was anti-Muslim, it, it shows that anti-Muslim rhetoric is not just a Muslim problem, it's a social problem, it's an American problem. And we really have to work more collectively with uh, these kinds of conspiracy theories that lead people uh, to violence. Um, I just just wanted to make that point as we're as we as Muslims are dealing with anti-Muslim animus in the United States. I think we have to frame it in a broader sense. Not it's not just about us. Uh, it's about the larger society. Uh, well, did you want to take? Yeah. Uh, Samantha, if I could, we can stay with you for, for another question. Um, MPAC and Engage partnered together on our recent report uh, regarding the double standards of U.S. Uh, FTO and domestic terrorism prosecutions. Uh, we've seen, for example, uh, all too often when uh, somebody of the Muslim faith commits uh, a terrorist act, it's immediately labeled an FTO. Uh, case and, and they're prosecuted accordingly all, all too often. Yeah, we just discussed the white replacement theory, which is a transnational and a global movement and ideology, yet 
when a white perpetrator commits those same acts, uh, in some cases uses the manifesto that was refers to the attacks in New Zealand against Muslim worshippers and uh, you know uh, other atrocities committed by international uh, uh, Nazis in Europe and elsewhere, uh, it's prosecuted under domestic statute. How, how come we have still these contradictions and, and how can we address them moving forward, forward to unify them, but also when we continue to do that, we're really otherizing the Muslim community and Islam because it's always foreign. Uh, I'm wondering if you can just comment on that and let us know how we can perhaps overcome this. I want to respond to your question, but first I just want to piggyback on the comment that was made about the white replacement theory um, and the fact, yes, it is transnational. Yes, uh, in France, um, uh, where I'm from, um, a lot of the white replacement theory is focused on uh, perceived Muslim immigrants just based upon immigration flows into France. In other countries, it's focused on other populations that are immigrating into the country and replacing white Christians. The fact of the matter is that both from a personal perspective, based on my family's history as a daughter of a Holocaust survivor and as the Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism, the fact of the matter is that these hateful conspiracy theories, when they affect one community, they affect all of us. And from a professional perspective, what we are seeing is, um, I'm trying to think of the right term here, we see individuals kind of shopping for hateful things to focus on. So an individual may start out with anti-Muslim bias, piggyback onto anti-Semitism um, anti and just overall live within a culture of hate. And that's not to minimize the hate directed against any particular community. But from, again, from a personal and professional perspective, that is why we are focused on addressing hate with the nexus to violence, whomever the target of that may be, because it metastasizes so quickly. With respect to um, prosecutions, I'm going to defer questions on prosecutions to the Department of Justice um, because that's outside the purview of what I work on. What I can tell you is this. From the Department of Homeland Security's perspective, we are focused on preventing, detecting, and mitigating acts of targeted violence and terrorism, regardless of the ideological motivation or the perpetrator. And that comes into play as we talk about domestic prevention efforts, as well as um, the work that we do in coordination as, as part of our intelligence uh, evaluations and work with the law enforcement community. Um, regardless of whether an individual is directed by or inspired by a foreign terrorist organization or um, is motivated by what we call domestic violent extremism. So think about white supremacy or anti-government violent extremists. Um, what we are seeking under Secretary Mayorkas's leadership is to demonstrate through our actions, not just through my words today, but through our actions, that we are focused on the perpetrator potential violence and not focused on the underlying ideology and separating it out in the way that you just articulated. I will, I will share with all of you, um, I am aware of the history of the department's um, efforts in countering violent extremism and unintended and unfortunate consequences that occurred as part of that work, which is why I'm stressing the actions along with the words part as we seek to work with community members. Um, I spoke with um, MPAC leadership in the aftermath of Buffalo, but just as we continue our work, really showing you that our approach is different and that we are ideologically agnostic in this respect. Yeah, I, 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 I appreciate that. We appreciate that, uh, uh, Samantha. However, the term domestic terrorism is a misnomer because it is a transnational movement. And it and just mere perception and and to a large to some extent, the actual uh, what's actually happening on the ground is that domestic terrorism uh, is uh, for white nationalists who whose civil liberties will be upheld even under investigation and incarceration and uh, uh, prosecution. Yet, if, a, if, a, if an American Muslim who was born here is under investigation, they're put under the foreign terrorist investigation uh, framework who, and their civil liberties will be suspended and the whole community becomes the target. That's been the double standard we've been dealing with actually since 1995 when the Oklahoma City bombing uh, attack happened. It was blamed on Muslim initially, Muslims initially, but it turned out to be uh, these two white uh, militia members 
And the um, 1996 uh, anti-terrorism law was passed under Clinton, the Clinton administration. That's where you find the statute on the use of secret evidence, which was actually used against Muslims uh, after 9-11 and up to 9-11, actually. So the double standard is, is, is more than, um, you know, whether we, we, we can rely on our authorities to be agnostic uh, on the issue. And I, and I appreciate it. And I, and I, and I sense a, a lot of sincerity from you in saying that, but we need help in really reconciling these double standards uh, by uh, U.S. officials. And I hope we can, we can talk to you about that uh, more in the future. Did you want to comment on that or, or we, can, we can go on? What I'll just say is um, something I started with, which is I'm here to listen and I'm hearing what you're saying. And I think that an important follow on conversation would include the Department of Justice, the folks that are actually doing the investigations. Um, more than anything, it is my desire to partner with MPAC and uh, individuals joining with us today to identify these issues and seek to address them because we all have the, sh the same goal, which is to ensure the safety of our communities. Oh, thank you. We're, we're all aboard there and we'll, we'll invite the Department of Justice uh, uh, in the future. Now, uh, we want to go to uh, yeah. Diala. Um, You've heard a lot of what we've been talking about. I'm sure you have a lot to say about that. So why don't we let you uh, jump right in and, and join the conversation and comment on the questions and, and answers that you've heard so far. Thank you, and thank you for having me. And I have to apologize for my several octaves lower voice. Uh, it's, been, it's been a rough week, um, but I'm really glad to be here with you all. Um, and congratulations on putting this conference on. Uh, you know, I. I really appreciate being in the space because uh, Muslim, Arab, South Asian communities are in an incredibly difficult position um, right now and want to acknowledge that. Um, so the challenging position is of being amongst those, as you laid out in your comments, uh, who are maybe the most motivated to want to see real concrete solutions to white supremacist violence, um, while also having a very good reason or a whole slew of really good reasons to be wary of many of the proposals to expand um, U.S. counterterrorism laws or the U.S. counterterrorism infrastructure, which has you know, predominantly been used um, and deployed very aggressively against Muslim communities here in the U.S. Um, and, and abroad, too. Um, as, as I'm sure is no uh, surprise or nothing new to this audience, the counterterrorism campaign has included um, demographic mapping of Muslim communities, uh, documenting things like where they eat and they pray, mass suspicion of surveillance programs, oftentimes in the name of, you know, radicalization theories that are being re-upped um, as we look for solutions of how to address, you know, the abhorrent uh, incidents like uh, the Capitol riots and uh, the Texas shooting and Buffalo shooting and the list goes on and on. Um, these uh, radicalization theories have been uh, repeatedly shown to be flawed, um, you know, in the most crass versions have named things like identifications of Muslim types of behavior as indicators of potential criminality. Um, and over the years, and as a result of, you know, really significant challenges by uh, Muslim organizations and other civil liberties groups, they've been um, somewhat refined, improved, altered, uh, transition to counter violent extremism programs, but they still are sort of based on that very same fundamental idea. Um, and and I, I don't know that I've really heard uh, good solutions. And, and I wanna sort of weigh in on, so a couple of things that were said, um, moments of, I mean, I, I sort of invite us to think in sort of a, a longer view, right, temporally. You were right to bring up the Oklahoma City bombings. Um, that was in 96. And although the ostensible purpose was to address white violence, um, the result was the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, which primarily uh, you know, criminalized uh, or added a set of charges. It tar primarily targeted you know, communities of color. Um, it made non-citizens who had lived legally in the US for years suddenly are subject to automatic deportation, uh, material support laws borne out in the EDPA um, ballooned and uh, they now encompass uh, protected First Amendment conduct. We see that kind of uh, fallout every day at, at CCR and how material support, um, the chilling effect of expansive material support laws um, is very real, including in, in, in Muslim communities and 
Palestinian advocacy groups, um, as well as, you know, uh, anyone else, you know, uh, I just kind of want to note that there is not only the criminal the threat of criminal prosecution, but there are also expansive civil prosecution elements that are being used right now today very aggressively against advocates and activists um, as a way to silence them in uh, litigation that's called strategic litigation against public participation. And so that, oh, sorry. No, I just want, if I could just stop you there and ask, so what would you recommend as, as the main um, approach to addressing white uh, supremacist violence against uh, communities of colors and against minorities? Uh, how, how would you advise the government pursue that? Because at the end of the day, we do need security, mm -hmm. but what would be the alternative for the existing policies and laws? Now, I would just add also that yeah. the, the Muslim community, perhaps more than any other community, plays a double role. One, it is really uh, one of the primary targets of white supremacists globally, uh, as well as in the US, uh, alongside the Jewish community and, and perhaps the African-American community, especially in America, but also have been viewed as public enemy number one in many circles, particularly uh, during the global war of, on terror. So we're both the recipient as well as, well, the recipient on both ends here of being uh, viewed with suspicion as a perpetrator, but also uh, knowing ourselves as uh, the primary victims. Um, I really can't think of another community that's kind of stuck in this position. And it is having an adverse effect on how we conceptualize our role and engage from a, from a position of strength and comfort. You know, we're worried about the United States and our democracy. We're worried about what's happening in the fight against global fascism. And, and we have a role to play but there's all this baggage, all these legacy issues that we're dealing with that are making it difficult for our community, our organizations to figure out our rightful place in this very important conversation and policies. Go ahead, Yana. Expand on that point. I mean, I think it's a really yeah. important one. And, and you can I disagree, add, by the way, but that's just where we see it. No, I think it's, it's right on. Um, and I would add that, um, you know, black political dissent in the U.S. has also been something that has been targeted by even the domestic terrorism language. And this is where, you know, you were so right in the previous conversation, and I would love to have further engagement on this question of the distinction between foreign terrorist organizations and domestic terrorist organizations, as you laid out really effectively, domestic, uh, foreign has become, not to use an academic term, but racialized as Muslim. Uh, because of who, which organizations are predominantly on uh, U.S. foreign terrorist lists and so on. Um, and domestic, we're now trying to say or solve for the problem by saying, well, that's going to be white supremacists, right? But where in the definition of domestic terrorism are we actually gearing it towards uh, the ostensible targets of a lot of these pushes, right? White violence, um, white supremacist violence. And, you know, of course, it's not politically palatable, palatable to pass a bill or legislation that says we're going to go after white supremacists. Um, it's more politically palatable to say we're going to go after all domestic, uh, racially motivated, violent extremists. And what we also have seen, and you'll forgive me for having deep mistrust in agencies, um, given the long history in, in a lot of you know, federal law enforcement agencies, given the long history of um, of, you know, repression and discriminatory um, uh, reactions to civil rights movements as well as Muslim communities. Uh, and, and so the question is, well, maybe right now we have the right administration in place and we have the right motivations in place, but what happens once we've passed these expanded authorities and we have the doubling down as we did under the Trump administration um, against, for example, black communities uh, who've been named, uh, you know, there was a crass term, term of black identity extremists that was used in, in light of the Black Lives Matter movement. And then that sort of gotten gobbled up in the racially motivated violent extremism uh, definition. And so there's sort of equality there, against white extremists and black extremists. And I, I, I just wonder where the guardrails are for abuses in the future. Hmm. No, thank you for that. And, and it, it's a complicated subject, but I think we're in a better place, at least in terms of the discourse of it. Uh, and this is where I'm, I'm just so appreciative that Samantha has joined us and, and, and the, you know, the current leadership of the Department of Homeland Security genuinely cares about these issues, these contradictions, and, and you know, 
we know that affected communities are part of the conversations finally. Uh, Samantha, looking forward, uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that the administration and particularly DHS are doing to and have done to reshape, revamp, you know, what we still refer to as countering violent extremism programs, CBE. What happened to them since the administration has taken over? Uh, and, and why should we be less worried, if indeed we can be, about the excesses of such programs? Where are they now? And, and just educate the, the audience about them and, and the thought process behind the changes. I'm glad that you asked that because we have a lot of work to do with Muslim community and other communities to show with their actions that our approach is different. I'm going to share with you how that, appro how that approach is different. But what we seek to do uh, is put that into action at the community level so that it's not just me speaking to you, it's all of you seeing this and starting um, to trust that we are taking a different approach. We recognize that the most effective prevention mechanism today is based on identifying indicators that an individual may be going down a path to violence. The threat profile of individuals per, uh, perpetrating violence, if we look at over the last several years, there are commonalities, common indicators, and I mentioned a few of them before. So consuming extremist content, spending time on extremist websites, um, uh, making threatening statements, things of that nature. The other commonality that we see is after almost every attack, people around the subject say he or she was making threats. You know, he was spending a lot of time reading the Christchurch Manifesto, but I didn't want to get him in trouble, so I didn't want to call the police or, you know, spending a lot of time on these, you know, in these extremist chat rooms, but, you know, I didn't really think it was gonna lead to something, so I didn't take any action. Almost after every single, almost after almost every single attack, we hear that. What our new approach does that um, was launched in May of last year under the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships, what we seek to do is educate people around the country on what those indicators are. And from there, educate people on how to seek help. Our approach is not law enforcement centric. There, I was speaking with black community leaders last week and made this point. There may be cases where law enforcement should be involved if there's been a, uh, where, where that's warranted. What DHS approach, DHS's approach seeks to do is educate people on the indicators, instill confidence in seeking help from uh, a network of professionals that might be social services, youth services, mental health practitioners, a coach, a faith leader, what have you. Um, such that it's not just calling 911 and the police saying, um, we can't help you because a crime hasn't been committed. We want to get at the early stage of prevention. But number two, this law enforcement is not always the answer. So, you know, in the case of Buffalo has been publicly shared, an individual made a threat. There was some mental health attention and then pause, right? Nothing happened. There was no ongoing care. We seek to avoid that exact situation. Um, and as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, this is not focused on one any on any type of single um, racial profile of a particular individual. This is focused on what those indicators are. The tough part is in educating people around the country, and then even tougher is instilling the confidence to ask for help because people are worried about getting their friends and family thrown in jail, distrust of police, distrust of government entities. So we have work to do. Uh, we have work to do. And my hope is that we can work together in this endeavor. Again, I realize that that's going to take time, but that that is a new prevention approach. We have field staff around the country um, that seek to engage at the, at the local level. We are also, this is an endeavor that I announced to Homeland Security Advisors about two weeks ago after Buffalo. We are very focused on supporting states in the development of targeted violence and terrorism prevention strategies that take this, um, the approach based on these indicators and create these local prevention networks of, pre of prevention practitioners that know how to provide help and ongoing care. We can't do it all on our own. <laughs> so we need help from community members and hope to work with all of you on that. And again, to show you that our approach is different and that it's effective.
I'm so sorry. I think you guys are muted. I don't know if I'm the only one having an audio issue. Okay, I think we're back. We're back. I, I was just I was just applauding you, Samantha. You didn't hear it. Um, but <laughs> but yes, uh, and and we we appreciate what what you said, uh, Samantha. And and I'm imploring our community to take up the offer to engage because we're not going to come to any solution without engagement. Uh, we can't just criticize from afar or um, isolate ourselves. We we have to. Uh, be in the arena, be seen for what we're doing, and and contribute. Um, and there is no right answer, and, and and actually there's no wrong answer either. It's these are all uh, trial and error attempts to addressing a very very complex issue. I, I had two points though I wanted to follow up on, and both of you can answer. Uh, I was at a Council on Foreign Relations conference talking about uh, the rise of white supremacist violence, and the speaker had said something that was very interesting and somewhat controversial, uh, but it generated a lot of conversation. She said that after 9-11, religious ideology was overemphasized. After January 6th, religion and ideology was underemphasized. Do you agree with that statement? And if you can elaborate. I'm curious what is meant by overemphasized in the context post-January 6th. I think what we are, what we are finding today within our borders. So when, when I refer to kind of the dom domestic terrorism I'm referring to within our borders, what we are finding today is that the most significant terrorism related threat facing our country co comes from lone actors and small groups of individuals. Um, within, that within that subset, we are finding um, that a large majority of those individuals are racially or ethnically motivated and or mo motivated by anti-government um, or anti-authority motivations. So based upon all that, the emphasis on religion, for me, I'm focused more on um, the, what the threat actors ideological motivations are in that respect. And we're finding a lot of racially and ethnically motivated and anti-government and anti-authority. Diala? Um, I am not an expert on white supremacist violence or what I assume is the intended point of the comment that you quoted is Christian, uh, you know, whether Christianity or uh, various forms of Christian beliefs should be factored in. I, I really don't think I can weigh in on this, but it goes to this broader point of wanting to and seeking answers to address the sort of like discriminatory um, uh, history and how Islam has become historically a sort of stand-in for potential for violence. Um, and I, I, I wanna make sure that, you know, that I don't leave unanswered your earlier question of, well, what do you think we should do? Um, because it's easy to say what, uh, you know, to, to talk about the pitfalls of all the various proposals. Um, and again, this is, you know, probably completely beyond uh, the scope of my area of expertise and certainly beyond the scope of my job, but, uh, we do need political withdrawal of support for Republicans promoting white supremacists and election fraud ideas, right, of gun control. Uh, we need more transparency. For instance, what, it, what would it look like to demand that federal agencies make public how they have and are now using existing resources, right, let alone expanded resources to fight white supremacist violence? Um, again, this goes back to the point that there's no shortage of existing law enforcement uh, tools in the toolbox. Um, and so how can we uh, have more uh, data sharing and transparency and insight into how uh, these existing resources are being deployed? Um, and I wanna acknowledge that these are some of the provisions that were in uh, proposed legislation, the Domestic Terrorism Act that didn't make it through last week. Um, and I just wanna send uh, kudos to all of the organizations that were involved in really difficult conversations and kind of in, improving the language in that bill to take out what you know many civil liberties advocates felt were some problematic um, aspects to it uh, you know noting that that uh, there's been a domestic terrorism kind of legislation uh, on the roster forever and every time there's an act of violence it gets re-upped and you know I think it gets a lot of more momentum in these moments but um but that provision, you know, there's a lot of data sharing there. There's more transparency. Um, and so I, I do think some more of that would be interesting. Um, but I also think that we have to continue to press for uh, maybe with more urgency now than before, rolling back 
broad FBI authorities because currently there's a Biden administration in power and we don't know who the next administration is going to be. And that is a source of real concern for many folks who saw what happened under the previous administration. Um, and so I don't want us to lose focus on that consistent and constant fear. It's, and it's a continuing uh, effort, continuing struggle uh, that I think all of us in civil society must continue to work on. And, and I appreciate what you said, Diala, and also Samantha, that we really need to engage communities uh, on, on these issues and make them part of the solution. Uh, and I think that is the one difference I see uh, so far in, in, the, in this, uh, uh, this latest phase uh, of countering this national security threat. And, and we hope to continue engaging. Uh, I also wanna just emphasize uh, on behalf of our organizations that we wanna engage Republicans who are in agreement that this is uh, this white supremacist violent threat is, is a major issue and who push back against any kind of conspiracy theory against uh, mm -hmm. our community or, or all communities for that matter. So we, we definitely wanna move away from this being a partisan issue. It, it's a national issue. It's an issue of, uh, of, uh, of uh, all people, Republicans and Democrats alike. And so we will engage with Republicans who at least uh, are willing to listen and engage with us on that issue. The, 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 the follow-up question um, that we have uh, on this issue is, in the time when, we were, when ISIS and Al-Qaeda were considered the major threat, uh, there was a strategy uh, with, with uh, countering uh, their violence. Uh, one aspect of that strategy was to come up with a counter narrative. At that time, ISIS and Al Qaeda were saying America is at war with Islam, and so in many of this, uh, the counterterrorism circles, there was this idea that we have to come up with a counter narrative that America is accepting of Islam and America is engaging and integrating is a place where American Muslims can be uh, equal citizens and so on and so forth. That was the counter narrative, whether it's the right one or not, that's another matter, but that what, there was an effort to come up with a counter narrative mm -hmm. to these uh, terrorist groups. What is the counter narrative? What do you think we, we should be thinking about in terms of the counter narrative to the great white replacement theory? I mean, we, uh, we have an idea we can, we can we can uh, we can assert now, and you can comment on it. Or if you have your own ideas, we we'd love to, we'd like to hear them. I'd love to hear your ideas. Uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, I think you know what we've been talking about inside MPAC is that the counter narrative to the great white replacement theory is the great enrichment theory. In other words, that we Muslims, Jews, Blacks, Latinos, uh, people of all backgrounds have enriched America from our contributions, our mere presence, our, uh, our, our increasing the wealth uh, of our country, the economy of our country, vital contributions in science uh, and culture. And that counter narrative needs to be amplified by our government. In other words, we may not be able to contain hate speech because it's, a first, it's, a protect, it's protected speech under the First Amendment, but we should demand from each other that we lift responsible speech uh, uh, as a counter to it. And so the great enrichment theory is, is a possible counter narrative to that. We've got some positive responses here in our audience too. <laughs> Go ahead, Samantha. Um, I think uh, the great enrichment theory, is that what you refer to it as? The great enrichment theory, is that what we're calling it? That's what I heard, yeah. Great, I don't know if our uh, our host can hear us. Is there another tech issue? Our hosts are frozen to me. Yes, oh, I see some perhaps are unfrozen. Can you, can you guys hear us? Yes. Okay, keep going. Great, so that's, I was just- I mean, that's, that's what- Oh, they can't hear? We got 20% or was it 8%? You guys are a bit frozen, so I'll just start talking and hope that you can hear me. Um, and if you give a thumbs up, that would be great if you can, in fact, hear me. I think 
Um, I think in general, the administration did publish a national strategy to counter domestic terrorism last year. We're actually uh, uh, creeping up on the one year anniversary, which is I believe June, uh, one day next week. Um, and there are several pillars to that strategy, which include um, greater information sharing and a lot of work in the prevention space. DHS has a lot of um, equities in both places. Uh, with respect to the counter narratives, um, it is critically important that we all as community members and just as Americans address hate wherever it arises. So um, it's incumbent on politicians. It's also incumbent upon every member of every community to discount these horrific narratives wherever they hear them. With respect to the broader counter narrative to the uh, white replacement theory, I think we all know in this audience, um, the incredible contributions that non-white Christians, Americans have made to this country. Um, a lot of us are living, or many of us in the, in the audience, uh, uh, speakers, we're literally living examples of that today. We don't need to convince ourselves, um, but certainly the more that anybody can get that message out, I think is very helpful. Um, but even just as critical is again, when these horrific narratives start circulating, that everybody speaks up and says this is abhorrent, it's inaccurate, and it has to stop. Because what we're finding is not only because we have people in positions of power um, and in the media promulgating these narratives, they so quickly gain steam and are taken as fact. They're no longer, people aren't talking about the white replacement theory only in you know encrypted platforms anymore or in secret spaces. They're becoming mainstream. So in addition to the counter narratives, we have to take them out of the mainstream because of the nexus to violence um, and, and address them as they're promulgated in each of our communities. And that's hard, right? That's hard. You hear something important, you're so shocked. Um, you don't really know what to do and you stand there with a stricken look on your face. We, we all, and not just this audience, every American has that responsibility because otherwise we're seeing these narrative, narratives lead to acts of violence. Diala, did you want to comment? I, I think you're uh, noting about whose role is it to put out, you know, narratives and questioning whether that's the government's role versus, um, uh, you know, looking to other parts of uh, our institutions and society is, is, is an important one. And I also want to uplift a comment in the chat, the, um, the concern about the enrichment theory um, is it might support the model minority stereotype that is oftentimes used to divide. Um, and I think that's a really important uh, note. I think we, st we have so much work to undo the flaws of the terrorism narrative um, that has really uh, just like stigmatized Muslim communities. And I, 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 I don't know what the best way to, to tackle that is. And I just, you know, and also uplifting your point of not, certainly not doing anything that entrenches it further. And then maybe this brings us back to our conversation about why Muslims are foreign terrorists, even when they're homegrown, right? Allegedly, um, or what the, to use to use parlance of the FBI. Um, whereas whether white white supremacist violence is inherently domestic. Um, and, and that's not just a narrative problem, of course. Um, certain investigative tools are unleashed um, that can't be unleashed when it's a uh, foreign terrorist organization as opposed to a domestic terrorist organization. So it's not really an, an, you know, an, an, just an abstract or a narrative discussion. And I really would uh, want to uplift Shireen, Professor Shireen Sinar, who's a professor at Stanford Law School, who's been doing a lot of thinking and writing um, on this particular question of really challenging um, why we're talking about domestic terrorism versus foreign terrorism. Uh, if I can pivot a little bit, uh, but still remain connected to the to the subject at hand, Samantha, the administration has uh, promised and, and in some areas has done a really good job in terms of diversifying the workforce, uh, particularly in the national security sector and other agencies. What has the department done in this area and how far do you, do you think it still has to go uh, in terms of representation, credible representation? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, people are policy. And all too often we look at these spaces and uh, affected communities are, are, are still not represented in the middle or senior tier of, of these agencies. Uh, 
you know, there's been some great movements in some regards, but wanted to get your thoughts a little bit about uh, how you see it and, and what still needs to happen. From, I'll speak from the DHS perspective, and I think I'm, I can speak on behalf of the administration on this. Increasing equity um, and diversity in our workforce is a core priority. Um, so uh, at the department, um, the secretary is deeply focused on that. And through the Domestic Policy Council and broader other initiatives at the White House, that's a core focus for the administration in general. But increasing equity and increasing diversity is not just a focus for us on the personnel side. And I don't want to discount that. I will tell you, I am lucky to work alongside um, some incredible uh, Muslim American colleagues, many of, of them you know well. But across the um, equity and diversity spectrum, we, we have work to do, and we're committed to that work. In addition to that, it is a core priority for the department um, to just ensure that we have equity across our resources. And I realized that for the Muslim community and for other communities that um, were suffered the unintended consequences of previous CV, CVE efforts, it's gonna take time for all of you to trust us enough to take resources from us. So I, I get that, I hope that we can get there. But among our you know, tens of millions of dollars in grant funding for hardening facilities, getting, getting cameras, putting up, um, doing risk vulnerability assessments, engaging in prevention work, um, we are really, really focused on increasing equity across um, the full range of, of our grants. And again, I know it's gonna take some work for us all to get there, but we need grants to go to people that need them the most. <laughs> and um, members of um, various communities are very uh, used to applying for grants um, and aware of the grant opportunities. We wanna ensure that all communities are aware of the opportunities and also feel comfortable applying. So that's a really big focus for me over the next year and I hope we can work on it together. You guys are still on mute. Go ahead now. All right, uh, I have one last question from the audience. The question is, we'd like to know how we look at our groups work collabor collaboratively with local authorities with vandalism and other hate crimes. If it isn't reported as a hate crime, even events issues really get pushed up. However, later it is found. I'm really sorry. I can't, I can't make, I think you get the gist. Underreporting the hate crimes. Under something worse has happened to you. I'll keep track of issues that occur at our places of worship. Why recommendations do you, what recommendations do you have to the community and how to help best support these organizations when issues arise or even before? Um, so I think that was one question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it I'll yeah. make it brief, but um, so as I articulated, our whole approach in the prevention space is focused on engaging at the community level. And so we have these regional prevention coordinators all around the country. We want to ensure that they're engaging with individuals across the country when incidents like this arise. Um, we call them RPCs, but um, the hate crime reporting is a key piece, but when there are matters, that are affecting you and your communities, affecting your safety, um, we wanna make sure that they're addressed and that the full local prevention network is involved to make sure that all of you are staying safe. So um, I would love to introduce our, our team to folks that are on this call um, through MPAC or otherwise to ensure that there's, that there's that point of contact for when these incidents occur so that we can work together to address them. And of course, work together to try to prevent them from occurring in the first place. Thank you. Diala? I, uh, I'm not sure I have much, I uh, wasn't fully understanding the question maybe, but if it is about the problem or whether hate crimes as a framework is maybe a way to address a lot of this. Um, you know, I think that's a really interesting point and that has been a lot of the primary response. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of short, uh, shortcomings with the hate crimes framework it you know it's not uh it's it's sort of post facto usually it's like after you've already been harmed and then what it does is maybe uh increase uh your sentence or increase punishment 
um, as a model versus you know the preventative one that Samantha is really underscoring here. Um, I I really want to uh, underscore, uh, and I feel like I'm plugging her twice now on a panel, which is always a good sign. Shirin Sinar, Professor Shirin Sinar, has also written an article about this <laughs> that I can circulate to the audience after this call, um, and I think she kind of gets into this in more detail in terms of how to look at the differences of hate crime versus terrorism frameworks. I think uh, as as we close, we as a community have to ask ourselves the question, is prevention a worthwhile endeavor or not? Uh, do we need violence prevention programs? And if the answer is yes, then we have to work uh, on coming up with ideas, uh, suggestions in terms of policy, but always make sure that there is a demarcation, a separation, a wall of separation between intervention in terms of social services, public health, mental health, religious counselors, community leaders on the one hand, and government and law enforcement on the other hand. Um, that seems to me is where the conversation is, is, has been going for the last 10 years. We haven't come to a resolution on it, but it is important that we continue working uh, on the prevention space uh, while ensuring that civil liberties are upheld uh, in any program. And I think as Diala has been talking, it reminds us of the words of Benjamin Franklin that you cannot have temporal safety with the suspension of civil liberties. If you do that, you deserve neither. So uh, with that, I thank both of you, uh, Diala Sh uh, Shamis uh, of the Center for Constitutional Rights, the great work that they've done uh, and what you're doing right now for our country and Assistant uh, Secretary uh, Samantha Vinograd. Uh, I think as, as you were talking before, you were the first uh, US official to call the Muslim community after the Buffalo incident. I think this is immediately after you took your post. You were the first US official to call the Muslim community and ask them, are you okay? And, and that means a lot to us uh, as a partner uh, in this and uh, we hope to continue these conversations, these very complex issues with you. Uh, and we appreciate the, the, the effort you've made in reaching out uh, to our community and all communities. And we look forward to working with you in that uh, healthy partnership. No, thank you to our uh, great panelists, to our audience, to you, Salam, for all that you do and MPAC and uh, the other co-hosts of this conference. Look, the midterms are around the corner. and our votes do matter, irrespective of what your politics are. If you agree with what our government does and is doing on our behalf, great. If not, we probably should let them know. And the issues are before us, gun violence, access to voting rights, reproductive rights, criminal justice, human rights abroad. How do we feel as an electorate about these issues? And do they represent our interests and our values? What type of policymakers are in power? Are we engaged with them? Do they know about our issues? And are they factoring them into their decision making? So we really hope that this conversation and the, the next conversation, which is going to be focused on international issues, gets you thinking and, and caring about these subjects and moves you to act. Uh, if we don't do it, no one else will do it for us. So I'm going to conclude this conversation. Thank you again to everyone. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're going to take a three minute break. So, for those of you at home, you can get a drink of water, get a cup of coffee, whatever you like. Don't go away. We have some Just don't go amazing away. speakers coming we have up. Peter Beinart, Summer Ali, John Feiner in our next panel. We really would like you to, to remain, uh, remain uh, with us in this next important conversation. So, we'll take three minutes and we'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you.